Welcome back everyone to the lectures about bioimage analysis. Today we will talk about generative artificial intelligence for bioimage analysis. So these slides are motivated by a recent development. I guess you all have heard about it, ChatGPT. So we are using Google now for a couple of years and we enter terms and we start typing. And for example, why are all scientists German? <laughs> <laughs> so Google is smart to a certain degree and it can predict the next word according to some probabilities. I don't know where this is from, yeah. But this is a form of artificial intelligence predicting the next word. And this technology has evolved in recent, recent years quite a lot so that we can now do the following. So this is done with GitHub Copilot based on GPT and you may have heard about that before. So I start typing here a doc string, a documentation of this algorithm, agglomerative clustering, and it basically auto-completes entire sentences explaining what agglomerative clustering is or might be. So this makes the life of a programmer much easier nowadays. So we are sparing plenty of time when coding because we have this artificial intelligence, this generative AI supporting us in writing code. In the lecture today, I would like to show how this is relevant for image analysts, for people who write image analysis code on a daily basis. But first have a look, let's have a look in generative AI and what it actually means. So generative artificial intelligence is a type of artificial intelligence capable of generating text images or other media in response to prompts. Um, so this is commonly based on neural networks and it bridges to research fields, natural language processing and computer vision. So technically what the input is, it's typically a prompt, so a sentence or multiple sentences describing something. And we typically also need some form of noise. We feed all that into a neural network and then we can, for example, get out a picture of a cat in a microscope. So this is like what artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence is capable of doing. And there's plenty of use cases for this kind of technique. So if you do not produce images, but if you produce text, we can, for example, feed English text in on the left side and get German or French text out on the right side. This is also what this technology was successful in, in its very early days. Nowadays, you can also ask it to write emails, texts, proposals. Um, so it's quite fascinating. Also, it can summarize research articles. So you give it a long text and it will give you the most important information from this long text in a shorter form. It can write code. This is what I will talk mostly about today. And it can answer questions. I'm not saying that it is always answering correctly, but it can answer. <laughs> so it has also some drawbacks and I will come back to this as well. We will also have a look a little bit into how to generate images using this technique. But let's first have a look a little bit in how this historically these kind of algorithms came up. One of the first form of neural networks which can generate new images was generative adversarial networks, GANs, um, or at least I have seen it in the first um, attempts like that. So here I have some modified some slide from Alexander Dibrov, a former colleague of mine in Meyer's lab. So the use case for that could, for example, be generating training data, generating microscopy images, which look realistic so that we can then use segmentation algorithms on this generated data for getting training data for other techniques. So also here we take a artificial segmented binary image, maybe a generated simulated image. We take some noise and then we use a generator in order to generate a synthetic fake image, which looks like an image from a tissue with some membrane staining. We also have a collection of real images and then we can feed these images, the real one or the synthetic one, into another neural network, which makes a differentiation if this is real or fake. So if we, for example, feed it in an artificial image and it is detected as artificial image, um, as fake image, then we have to update the generator. So the generator has to be trained then like with common algorithms like backpropagation. Um, if we feed in a synthetic image and it is discovered, it is like detected as a real image, we have to update the discriminator network. And in these this way, we basically update these two networks so they both become better over time. And at some point, um, the generator will produce really realistically looking images, um, which correspond to these kind of example images we had in this folder of real images, let's say. So this is how the how GANs technically work. 
There's also an approach called uh, variational autoencoders, VAEs. Um, it's also a neural network, this time visualized a little bit differently. So we find here layers, um, which typically become a bit wider um, and uh, have like more information, which is not spatially, but kind of more uh, information about the image itself. And we have this so-called bottleneck, the embedding sitting here in the middle, um, where we basically for every signal determine the mean and the standard deviation and can then sample from that. So this trick here in the middle of this autoencoder allows us to generate as many data as we want basically to train the decoder side to get an output image out again. And when you read papers like this, so for example here, I had a look in that one down linked down there, um, you will read that um, this kind of technique is, if you think about it, we have a mean and a standard deviation here, typically comes up with images which appear a little bit blurred. So what this is doing here in the very center, of my interpretation, yeah, is something like a Gaussian blur to the data. But the cool thing is that this technique allows us, after training, allows us to combine multiple images of different kind. If you want to, for example, combine data of different types, so not image in, image out, but you, were, for example, want to combine a noisy image and some text as the input to train it on an image which is not as noisy of the same scene. So this is the training setup basically. Um, you can then later use such a network. We can then later use an image with random noise, not related to the original, to any original data. We can use a random noise image and some text to put it into this network to produce an image, for example, where a cat is sitting next to a microscope. That's pretty amazing so that we can take random noise and the prompt to generate a realistically looking image. But it's, it's obviously not easy to just input text into a neural network. That's why this dotted line here. Um, so this is, must be a more complicated approach. So how does that work? We first of all have to find some kind of a word embedding or sometimes called language embedding where we have words or phrases in a high dimensional parameter space and embedding. So I'm showing here two dimensions, but in fact, these techniques and these technologies is typically hundreds or thousands of dimensions. I'm just showing two to explain the principle. So you find in this embedding, there is some relationship between black and white. These two are close by each other because they are both colors. So if something can be black, it can also be white just depends on how somebody painted it. The microscope is not so much related to black and white, even though it is black and is white, so you can maybe draw a connection, but it's like microscopes, black, white, not so common relationship. A much more common relationship is, for example, between cat and fur. Cat and fur are closer related to each other because every cat has a fur than a microscope and some color. Also, microscopes and cats have similar relationships to black and white. That's why this distance here is similar and also fur and microscope are very far away from each other because there are not so many microscopes which have a fur. So you basically have to generate such a thing where each word or each term, each phrase is expressed with numbers in this embedding. And when you can make that happen, if you can turn a word like microscope into a value 0.1 and here 0.9 in this embedding, then you can use it to feed it into a neural network. So the big question now remains, how does this arrow work? Um, so this is also a neural network which does exactly that. And it uses a mechanism called self-attention. I also quickly want to outline how it works or how it is basically made. So if you look at the word white in this sentence, this white is pretty closely related to black because there is some relationship between these two. Also this word is, and then afterwards a list of colors tells there is some relationship between being, having a color and the color itself. The f we are here in this particular sentence, we are talking about the cat's fur, which is white. So that's why this fur here has a super high weight. The attention here is very, the attention score is very high. So there is a strong relationship between white and fur in this sentence. While for example, the word the here at the beginning pretty much says nothing about white. Also, this is trained with a neural network based on, a, that's at the end what a large language model makes. So it's a lot of text feeding into these networks. So you need a network in order to train a network in order to train a network. So 
this technique of neural networks of artificial intelligence, these techniques have developed quite far in the last year so that we are from, from, from training single networks to generating images. We have now networks which are necessary to train networks which are necessary to train networks. So the architecture of these artificial intelligence techniques become more and more complicated and you really need experts like hardcore experts, teams of experts in order to build up these techniques, um, this technology. So this is nothing somebody does on their laptop on an afternoon. So this training needs huge computational resources. Just a short detour, if you do image processing in Napari, you commonly see, for example, here Napari simple IDK image processing, that's a plugin I maintain. You see these nice plugins here on the right called widgets, and you can use these widgets, for example, I can click here on this button, and I can click on that button, and then I have a segmentation coming out. So this is like human written code. I maintain it. If it breaks, I update it. I upload it to the internet, and there are some people using this. And then there was recently Loïc Croyer from the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub in San Francisco. He came up with an Apari plugin, which can do my job. So he writes here, write a segmentation widget that returns a labels layer. And this tool called Omega, part of Napari ChatGPT, a Napari plugin, comes up with some code. So you see here this code. And you can also click on the run button and then it comes up with a segmentation. So this is a generative AI, ChatGPT based. It's a generative AI which produces code which solves this segmentation problem within Napari. According to Loïc, that's a weekend project. I think he spent multiple weekends and actually maybe some vacation working on that, but it's not his main job. At least it was not when he did that. So and this is pretty amazing. So this basic task of segmenting nuclei, ChatGPT is obviously aware of how to solve these problems because we have been on the internet talking about these kind of problems many times and there's plenty of scripts available on github.com and on stack overflow and on image.sc how to solve these kind of problems and that's why ChatGPT, the language model trained on the entire internet is aware of potential solutions and that's why it can present us these solutions and i would like to dive a little bit deeper into how this works and therefore we have to first clarify a, a term called deconstruction. We are using it in the new bias community in the network of European bioimage analysts. We are using the technique of deconstruction quite often in order to explain how image analysis algorithms or algorithms in very general work. So deconstruction is a method of software engineering to understand how existing software works. It allows us to prevent reinventing the wheel. So we do not have to come up with the same thing again if we understand very well how the existing thing works and can maybe contribute to the project. It also allows us to identify limitations and bottlenecks. So by looking into a software very deeply and testing it on some edge cases, we can figure out what it is good for and what not. Related methods are reverse engineering code review pair programming. So if you want to dive deeper, you can maybe Google these terms. When the computers like JetGPT and computer programs now write code, we humans should definitely be able to read code. And that's why I think this is a key skill. And I would like to quickly guide you through how to read code of Napari ChatGPT and see how it works. So this is Napari ChatGPT. I must admit the screenshots are a little bit outdated, but this is with this AI projects these days, they are updating so fast. If I would take no new screenshots for that slide, would be it would be outdated in four weeks again. That's why I will just explain it with a little bit outdated code. If you click here on the bottom, if you click on these links, you come to the code as it was before. The current version of Napari ChatGPT looks a little bit differently. So you have this folder structure. So you have here Napari ChatGPT. There's a subfolder Omega. That's the, the artificial intelligence tool, the interface we were talking to. And there's a subfolder tools and tools play an important role here in this context. So when you look into this tools folder, you will find multiple different tools. So there's a Google search tool, there's a math tool, there's a Napari file open tool and an Napari widget maker tool. So all these tools apparently do something, some of them in the context of Napari. And uh, you can also ask Omega which tools are there. So you can say, which tools do you have available? And it will list those. So it can give you hints of what you can do with Omega. So when you then look in more detail, for example, in the Google search tool, so that's a very simple one, I would say. That's why I've chosen it as an example. You find that's a Python class 
There's a Python function which takes a query, some string as input and hands it over to another Python function. So there's no, not much more to see here. Oh yeah, maybe the description is also very important. So you have to tell what this tool is useful for. So this tool is useful for when you need to answer questions querying the web. And then just, just for completeness, um, this search overview function which takes a string and then um, take hence this string over, it builds up a URL and it reads the information from that website and passes this information back. So it is basically asking a question to Google and returning the result again as a string. And that's the important thing here. Um, tools, like in quite general in this context, tools take a string and produce a string because they are working with a language model behind. And there's another tool which you find here, the Napari Widget Maker, which is not described in Python code, or there is some Python code as well, that's true, but most of it is this human language. So task, you are you competently write image processing and image analysis functions in Python. These functions should be pure, self-contained, effective, well-written, and syntactically correct. So you instruct the language model to produce code which has these properties. So that's actually quite interesting. So you have to basically write in quite detail what you want to have from the language model. If you write a function signature, or these function signature um, should contain integers, floats, and so on, you should never create a new instance of the Napari viewer because the, vari the variable viewer always is provided and contains the current viewer. And then here on the bottom, you find that the prompt I'm entering in the user interface goes there into this big prompt, which is like a, a long text. So you see also here are some, some lines missing, so it's even longer. I was just showing parts of it. And down here, the prompt goes, which you actually entered together with these generic instructions on top. And I quickly want to show a bit how these kind of prompts, what kind of result they might have. So this is like, you can also download this notebook. So I was exploring a bit how this works in a Jupyter notebook. You can download it from this URL. And I was giving here a GPT, I was giving it a simple question. Write Python code only, no explanatory text. Write a Python program that loads the file, blobs.tiff, labels the objects in the image, and visualize the results. Assume this program would be executed in a Jupyter notebook because I was executing it from a Jupyter notebook. It's not necessary to save the results, show the results results in Jupyter. Then the response of this would be that. So it gives me some code with second image, matplotlib, imread, so that's basically the translation of this part. Then I would like to threshold and label it as a labels variable. It converts also how it's visualized and then shows it with, with matplotlib. So it generates code which corresponds to my instructions here on the left and you can execute that code and it actually looks very nice. It looks like something you really want to have. For these Simple use cases like blob segmentation with some psychic image basic functions that, that works really nicely. Again, this has something to do with the fact that the internet is full of scripts where things like that are done. If you additionally put a, a request in there like draw a mesh between the labels with a maximum distance of 50 pixels, then ChatGPT is no longer able uh, to do that because it does not know how to draw this mesh. There is hardly any documentation on the internet that these kind of tasks are done. So you have to provide additional hints uh, like the one here. Uh, this is the code snippet for drawing a mesh between objects in a label. And you find here also there's the maximum distance variable and it will then automatically generate code which does exactly that. So if you execute this, again, the notebook down, you find there, you can execute yourself. If you ask ChatGPT for code for that and you execute it, first time there is a error message. Second time, it does something useful. Third time, error message. <laughs> then again, does something useful. Sometimes it does something useful, sometimes not. So this more sophisticated prompt with this challenging question, but also these additional hints, so this more sophisticated prompt produced useful results in five out of 10 runs, and there are errors in four out of 10. So it cannot solve this problem in half of the cases, but in the other half it does. So that's a hint. If you have, if you sit in front of ChatGPT and you ask it to generate some code and it does not work, 
just run it again. It's possible the second time it can. Also, uh, put more hints in there. Explain in more detail what you want to achieve. Tell, I don't want to have this library used, but I would like to use scikit image instead. And then the more precise you are, the better the result will fit to what you are expecting. Um, so do not just run it once and then be happy that it didn't work and fun fun, artificial intelligence. Try to use this tool in a good way and modify your prompts. That's the term. What you are doing then is prompt engineering. So you can generate code with that, as I have just demonstrated, but you can also generate images. For example, an image of a cat sitting behind a microscope would lead to images like this. And one of these four images is showing a real cat, the other three not. Also here, you will now see that, okay, they all look quite different. If you want to fool the viewer, if you want to have, for example, images which look more similar like the real cat, you have to also provide more hints. Like I would like to have an image of a cat sitting behind a microscope. Both are on a brown floor in front of a white wall. The cat is mostly white and has some black dots. The cat sits straight and the cat is a bit larger than the microscope. And then you will get results like this. Not all microscopes are physically correct and also maybe some cats, some virtual not existing cats were hurt by making these images. But if you compare them to the images I've shown before, the images look now much more realistic because I was describing this realistic image much better. And that's why the language model can produce an image which is much closer to the reality I'm expecting. And then you can also fool people. So if you, for example, ask for a single high resolution black white image of a realistically looking orange fruit slide imaged with a T2 weighted magnetic resonance imaging device, uh, get these images out. And one of them is real. Can you guess which one? I've chosen this example. So I've also done um, a survey on Twitter about that. So most of the people actually see it that this second image there taken from Alexander Kaprichev from the University of Oxford, where he was publishing these images online. I would like to point out here is if you do some quality assurance, you generate something and then you let experts guess which of these things were real and which of these things were generated. Make sure that you're using the right target audience. So I asked this question on Twitter and on Twitter, not everybody is a radiologist. So two thirds of the people on Twitter can see that. I'm now hypothesizing that if you ask this in a radiology department of a university hospital, its score would be much higher. Because if you learn in university how a T2-weighted MRI image looks like, you can immediately see that the other three are no T2-weighted images. So if you do this kind of quality assurance, make sure that the people you ask, the experts, have the right expertise. A little bit deeper into how this technology works. So if we take Napari ChatGPT and boil it down to the very bare minimum, we want to know how this internal machinery works. We, we look, we find a piece of code which is using a library called Langchain. So Langchain is used to combine the tools and it's using a language model behind to make decisions regarding which tool to use. I quickly want to demonstrate that. Also here again, um, you find example code and example notebook um, online. I'm now describing two Python functions. These two Python functions fulfill a certain task. Like the, like the first one is taking some text and it makes this text uppercase. The, sec the second function takes some text and reverses the order of the character. So this is what these two functions do. And I provide a list of tools. So this tool class here comes from Langchain where I provide this function and a description of what it is useful for. So this one is useful for making a text uppercase or capital letters. And this function here is useful for making reverse order of a text. So that is the description of the tools. And we give these tools together with some memory and a language model. We give it to Langchain and we produce an agent. And afterwards, we can interact with this agent. For example, we can say agent.run with this input, hi. I'm Robert, and it will respond, nice to meet you, Robert. As it has a memory, I can also afterwards ask, what is my name? And it will say, your name is Robert, because I gave it this information. That's why it knows. Uh, can you reverse my name so it can combine what it has stored in memory together with the functions which are available and can say in this very kind way, the response to your last comment was Trebor, which is your name reversed. So it can apply Python functions to text I gave it earlier. And uh, I can also combine multiple functions for 
for example, when I ask, do you know my name reversed and uppercase? So it will basically do both things in a chain. That's why this thing is called lang chain. So and if you think about what can Python functions do, I can with a Python function download data from the internet, segment nuclei and upload the number of nuclei from this image again to the internet. This is what a Python function theoretically could do. And Langchain allows you to call these functions. So depending on what kind of Python code you have implemented, you have access to, um, you can train a language model, you can use a language model to call these functions in a certain order by providing the right descriptions of these algorithms. Just a hint until here, I was devel developing these notebooks for trying out these things uh, in, I think it was May this year, yes. And uh, I was sitting a couple of days, I was sitting in front of my computer, preparing these slides, preparing these notebooks, and you are using a so-called OpenAI API account. So you have to sign up online, put your credit card number there, and then you can use this language model. So it's not free, you're not executing this on your local computer, you're executing code actually on a remote machine. Um, so for developing these notebooks and for running Napari ChatGPT for the slides I made until here, I paid something like three dollar and uh, seventy one cent. Just telling that executing code of this advanced language model technique actually costs real money. And then I dived a little bit deeper. I came up with a library. I called it a library called BioBob, Bioimage Analysis Bob, which is basically uh, Jupyter magic where you can write text behind and use these commands as I was just showing before with uppercase, lowercase, reverse. Um, but here in this case, we tell now the language model, please load the image blobs.tiff and show it. Uh, it can do that. That's actually quite nice uh, because it has a language model selecting the right function for loading the image and for showing the image. Uh, and it can also segment images. And here that's a quite useful example for demonstrating um, how explicit you have to be. If I tell the language model, please select, uh, please segment the blobs.tiff image, it will do that. But I would also expect to show the result and it does not. So you have to explicitly say, please show the segmented blobs image so that it actually visualizes that. Uh, you can also ask how many objects are there in the segmented image and there is a tool implemented which can count the labels in a label image and will then print out this number. So in this image, the maximum intensity is 64 and that's why Bob can tell there are 64 objects in a segmented image, segmented blobs. So that's quite useful. Uh, again, you have to to be explicit in what should be done. Don't expect that this is this this language model knows anything about image analysis in particular. It's just a language model. Sometimes <laughs> it was also a fun experiment. Um, language models have a little bit downsides sometimes, so they are not uh, super uh, reliable in all under all circumstances. So here in this case, also this notebook is online. Um, Please remove the background in the image and show the resulting image. So it will, it's, then it answers the background in the image blobs has been removed using a top hat filter and the resulting image is displayed. So this is obviously not true because I don't see the result. <laughs> I can't even presume that it was not even processed. So it did not do anything potentially. So you can also tell the, the language model Bob, no, it wasn't. Try the top hat filter again and then it does it. So uh, it is a bit tricky sometimes because it's a bit of, yeah depends on statistics depends on a language model and we also do not fully understand this technology yet especially those of us who are not in machine learning mainly working right so i'm an image analyst i do not work with language models on a daily basis at least not yet so that's quite fascinating that sometimes you have to insist no please apply this filter and then it does it it's conceptually different from writing python code in a jupyter notebook where you exactly know that this will be executed now just a little warning here by the end about Napari chat GPT or about language models executing Python functions in very general. So Napari chat GPT downloads and installs libraries on your computer. Um, so I would first of all, I would sit in front of the computer while using it and I would observe carefully what it's doing. It will not delete random files from your hard drive, right? So that's, it's not trained for that. It has no functions for that. This will all be fine. But when you see that it starts downloading weird stuff, maybe you cancel the program. Also make sure that you run it in a separate conda environment in a virtual machine in a sandbox so that you do not screw up your productive environment which you use for other projects at the same time so using this technology use it a little bit with care
So that brings us to challenges this technique brings. So I've already said something about data integrity, data safety, security. So again, you have to be a little bit careful what the language model is doing with your computer. In particular, if you have like tools available who can do stuff on the hard drive. And the computational costs of these neural networks are a huge challenge. And then we can talk about CO2 footprint and climate change. If running, if training such a model takes multiple weeks or months on huge supercomputers burning energy like entire airports and factories and stuff, uh, that's a big thing. So we should be a little bit careful in what we in, in how much we use this technology, how much we burn um, energy by training these models. Also accessibility. Obviously, only the very richest companies in the world can do this. Not a random university with their HPC cluster can train such a network. It's too complex. It's too big. So we need the resources of large corporate companies in order to do this. There's also bias involved. So I was actually amazed when I run when I was asking for this request, I was asking for a nice photo of a human. Um, I think I was using stable diffusion here. And I was actually surprised that half of these humans, also kind of reproducible, half of these humans were female and half of them were male. I was not expecting that, to be honest. But what is also quite obvious, they are all white. And this is also reproducible. <laughs> so there is some bias trained into this network so that the diversity of the population of the people on Earth is not reflected when you ask for a picture of a human. So in these kind of things, we still have to figure out, uh, have to make sure uh, to train networks, how to train language models so that they can deal with that. Uh, sometimes it has hallucinations. So for example, if you ask it who developed Gradoop, Gradoop is a graph uh, analysis library. Uh, the language model will say, oh, this was developed by the Professor Felix Naumann from the Haso Plattner Institute in Potsdam, Germany. And if you talk to the people at Skatze AI in Leipzig, they disagree because they made it. <laughs> so it is very confident. It is like saying it's speaking out as if it was true and it's not. So we have to be quite careful, in particular when we ask questions about physics, about people, about things, um, because this language model assembles somehow um, uh, information which might not always be true. So it's always good to also maybe check quickly afterwards if you have information like that, if you have other sources. Um, yes, there's also glitch tokens. Um, that was, I not find a good example online, unfortunately, which I could still try out. But what is fun, you can sometimes enter a sentence at the beginning of your prompt um, to uh, circumvent certain security um, implementations. So you can kind of break it internally a little bit to do something illegal. Um, so we have to still, we as a community, we still have to figure out how to do this. Um, we also have to deal with false information and fake news. I mean, fake news have been there before language models, but now language models and in particular like generative AI for producing images and generate realistically looking images from demonstrations against things which never happened. We have to also here as a society figure out how to deal with this, how to figure that out, how to um, use this generative AI the right way and not harming our society by its usage. Also debugging, now that I was working a little bit with this technology, um, debugging is quite hard. So if you have a language model, if you have some prompts uh, solving a specific task and it does not work, it's often very hard to figure out what do I have to, how do I have to change my English text my prompt so that it then works. It's really a very interesting challenge because it's not like coding where you change your program and then it does something differently as you expect. Um, but sometimes you change your program, your English prompt, and then it does something unexpected. And that's very exciting, very interesting to change prompts and see how this um, influences the result. Yeah, so as a conclusion, maybe we slowly come to the end. I quickly wanted to say something about generations of programming languages. So when you look that up on Wikipedia, you come to the second generation of programming languages, which were assembly languages. Also something I still learned in university, even though I might have been the last uh, student, one of the last students in this university who learned assembler. Um, that's the second generation of programming languages. Then structured and object oriented programming came up. You see here a C, C++ program. Um, that's the so-called third generation of programming languages. Then we were talking about um, constraint or logic programming. That's the fifth generation. And 
The sixth generation is visual programming. I also learned that by reading the Wikipedia article that, for example, CLIJ, this um, image data flow graphs I programmed some years ago, is a visual programming language, very obviously. I'm moving around images. They are connected with lines and the image data flows from the one to the other. And it's very convenient to program workflows like that. And I'm now postulating or guessing <laughs> Um, that human language and prompt engineering might become the second generation, the seventh generation of programming languages, maybe the last one. Because if we can type in a text what we want and the computer can do it, that's pretty amazing. It also reminds me of Star Trek where people are standing in front of a computer saying, computer, open the file and show me this thing because it's at hand. We can do that. It will be there next year. So it's like pretty amazing days to live in. If you want to read more about how these things work, you find here a link to a discussion of Louis Groyer with Stefan Saalfeld, Stefan Preibisch from Genelia um, and some others, I think, where Loic is a bit explaining how an Apari chat GPT works. And you find also here on the right uh, a link um, to uh, Digital Sreni, a guy from, from also from the US, um, who is explaining this particular individual parts um, like chat GPT and how you can use it, for example, for working with documents quite nicely on his YouTube channel as well. So you find here some links to dive deeper into these techniques. And I also have some exercises for you. So um, when you generate code, you can, for example, ask ChatGPT to generate code for a specific task like nuclei segmentation. Um, use the human mitosis example image from scikit image. You will see that um, ChatGPT can solve this problem, as I've shown earlier, and it can come up with reasonable good code, which will run in most of the situations. Then make this task more complicated. Ask for, can you please segment the border of these nuclei? Or can you count the number of neighbors within a certain radius and these kind of things? You will come to a point where ChatGPT cannot do this anymore. So, and then when you are at that point, then add more hints to the task. Like if you know how to count the number of neighbors, provide a code snippet, a generic code snippet, which can do that together with your prompt. And then you will see that ChatGPT is capable of reusing your general generic code snippet and build it into their program and then make use of it. So and you can go this, you can do this like in two or three steps, make it more complicated and explain it how to solve the complicated thing, make it more, even more complicated and explain it how to solve this kind of problem. And you will see See how this interaction with the language model um, actually allows you to solve complex tasks without typing everything in very detail yourself in the Python code. So the language model can do this for you. Then there's this exercise I also um, recommend build in a small print statement in these functions I've programmed here in this notebook and figure out when code is actually executed and why. You may notice that the memory is sometimes used and sometimes not. And does it recompute a result? And when does it take a result from a former computation stored in memory? Then there is uh, an example notebook online. Uh, take the same example notebook and extend it to do some image analysis tasks. So program new tools which load an image, for example, which segment an image. You find solutions for that um, in this notebook. And if you like, you can also extend the notebook by making more complicated tasks, like, for example, a membrane based cell segmentation. Um, if you have multiple segmentation algorithms implemented, that's the example here, um, apply, ask the language model to um, segment an image and see which algorithm it is choosing. Is it always choosing the same algorithm? Um, what if you have a segmentation algorithm for nuclei and you have a segmentation algorithm for cells with membrane staining and now you call the image file membranes.tiff. Will it always choose the membrane-based segmentation algorithm? Is the file name relevant for choosing the segmentation algorithm? So there's a couple of interesting questions you can explore together with this notebook. And then uh, you can also do a similar thing with Bob. So I have shown that before, that's this Python library um, where you have this um, Jupyter magic here. If you load Bob plain, just import it. Um, you can then say combine, combine A and B. And it will tell you that it does not know how to do this. It does not understand what A and B is. Here in this case, when, you ex I ex when I executed it, it was presuming that it's folders or files and it didn't know how to combine them. 
So, but if you tell it a new function combine, which takes two texts and then combines them, then you can ask it this question again, and it will then be able to combine A and B. So you can extend a pre-existing language model, which has some tools by adding new tools. Also here in this case, you can take these image processing functions from the notebook before which you programmed, and you can give it to Bob and then say, here, Bob, I have an image, please segment it and see which of these algorithms it's choosing and why. Hint. Um, this has a lot to do with this documentation here. So you have to write, it's eventually a reason to write good documentation for your functions. It will use the right tool if the documentation of the tool allows to choose it under the right circumstances. An advanced exercise, you can maybe consider it as optional if you like. Um, so in Apari Chat GPT, um, if you download this repository, you will find an example Omega tool. So you can extend this library with your custom tools. That's fun. Uh, consider doing that in particular when you already have some experience with uh, Python library development, with plugin development in Apari maybe. Uh, that's real fun. Uh, copy maybe this example Omega tool and implement new tools for Napari Chat GPT. If what you, whatever you do there, segmentation, counting objects, doing some qualitative measurements, whatever, if it works nicely, send a pull request to Luik. He will be happy to review that and will be happy to merge it, I'm sure. So I would like to thank um, my team in particular, uh, because uh, while I'm sitting in my kitchen giving lectures, they take care of the image analysis in the lab. Uh, I'm very glad for that. I also would like to thank the Jan Zuckerberg Initiative, who is funding our efforts in writing blog posts and code for Napari and uh, giving lectures about how Napari works. So thanks a lot for this opportunity and thank you for listening.